Hello viewers, welcome to this episode of Healthy India. And today we're going to talk some more about diabetes. Uh, as you know, diabetes is one of the most common non-communicable or non-infectious diseases that affects Indians. We have discussed diabetes in this program earlier and those episodes are available for you on the Sansad TV YouTube channel. So please do take out time to listen to those episodes. Today, the focus is on new technologies. How have new technologies impacted diabetes? Monitoring, management. And to discuss these aspects, we have the best of the best for you today. I have with me in the studio, Professor Nikhil Tandon, who is the Chief of Endocrinology at the Olinia Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And we have joining on Zoom with us, Professor Anil Bhansali, who was still recently Chief of Endocrinology at the PGI Chandigarh, another of our most prestigious institutions. And again, in the studio, we have Dr. Ganesh Javalikar, one of India's foremost pediatric endocrinologists. Uh, welcome, gentlemen, uh, to the show. And we'll be talking today about use of technologies in managing diabetes. And I start with the very basic, uh, Dr. Tandon, this is for you, the concept of empowering patients that happened when we were starting our careers in the, in the 80s, that you could measure your glucose yourself at home, and that would help you and your doctor to manage your disease better. But it's come a long way since then. So where do we stand with the blood glucose meter monitoring these days? So let me just start by a, a little tangent yes. uh, first. Management of diabetes, if you, if you ask any seasoned endocrinologist, they will say there are at least four major components. Lifestyle management, um, which is diet and physical activity, taking medication, whether it's oral or injectable, and monitoring, which could be either laboratory-based or self-based. And I think what is important to understand is all four are critical for the overall management. But as you rightly use the word for patient empowerment, the feedback which self-monitoring provides is perhaps the most critical part of this uh, set of four things. It provides, so it's, it's not merely treating patients. You need patients to achieve targets. For example, you know, what their sugar should be like, what their hemoglobin A1C should be like. And to achieve those targets, it's important for them to be able to do the measurements themselves so that they are themselves in the know of whether they are achieving what they'd set out to achieve. That's point number one. I think it's on a, at a level of behavioral feedback, it's also very, very critical that this is done. And of course, in acute situations, uh, you know, ongoing acute stresses and illness, this becomes important. Coming to your primary question, I think you would also remember that we used to run around wards in training when there used to be ancient meters, you used to put a drop of blood on a strip, had to wait for 45 seconds to a minute, then you had to wash that, yeah. blot it and put it into a meter. Now, you know, if you had to do 20 people at the same time, it was very, very time consuming and laborious and we've really gone a long way since then. Uh, meters are compact, strips are neater. You can actually get a readout within five seconds with, you know, one two hundredth of an ml of, of blood. More importantly, these data can be directly transferred onto electronic devices for the patient to store, can also be transmitted to the treating physician in real time. So the whole process of glucometers, monitoring at home, acquiring the information, Analyzing the information and transmitting it to the caregiver and or physician has now become one absolutely compact and efficient way of doing things. So I think many things have happened, you know, as, as you rightly pointed out, uh, the accuracy of the glucometers has improved, the ease has considerably uh, enhanced. I mean, in the sense that uh, the pain and the discomfort is much less. The pricks, as you said, such a small amount of blood is required. The time taken has shortened. And the ability to transfer data directly from the glucometer to a central server or to a mobile phone or to the healthcare provider has added a new dimension to the use of glucose meters. And I think that's 
very very important so those little things that all most people with diabetes use are actually have seen considerable progress over the years and that's become much easier it wasn't always this easy as it is now and i expect it'll keep becoming easier maybe there'll be you know non prick methods non invasive methods for measuring glucose sooner or later one small addition in addition, as as and with the transmission you can also enter other relevant information at the same time yes, yes. to help in the analysis what you ate when you ate yes. what was the nature of the food did you exercise so that can all come into the analytical process so so diabetes is basically about numbers a lot of diabetes is about numbers patients sometimes ask all you do is look at my numbers but lot of diabetes management is actually that and while cg while uh, glucose meters provide us these numbers and they can even provide it to the healthcare provider in real time but there has been huge advance in that also because we realize after all we are only measuring what once a day once a week sometimes five times a day six times a day but there are 24 hours in a day and if you are looking at actually controlling glucose throughout the day so in addition to uh, blood glucose monitoring you know which is a finger prick glucose as we call it which has become much easier much more advanced in terms of data collection and transmission but still you know it's it's still just a one point glucose and as you know uh, nowadays we are looking at a broader range like you're looking at maybe 24 hours monitoring so that is something that is called as continuous glucose monitoring so that has also changed a lot in the last few years you want to make a comment on the role of continuous glucose monitoring and the advances in technology that have made it so accessible now yes uh, you have rightly pointed out that uh, even if you do finger stick monitoring you can do once or twice or at best six seven times a day but these are like point pictures so they are like snapshots they are like photographs whereas continuous glucose monitoring will be like a video where you are seeing the trends on a 24 by 7 basis where uh, the sensor that is inserted in the subcutaneous tissue is monitoring the glucose levels it's not the, really inserted i mean it's just yeah, stuck on here yeah. little little thing goes in so that's why people shouldn't think that you have to implant it it's just <laughs> patients yeah. can do it themselves it's very easy yeah. it's 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 very easy and yeah. it is uh, there in the uh, it is monitoring the glucose level of the fluid in the subcutaneous tissue uh, and there are different kinds of devices uh so this according to me has been the most exciting advance in terms of technology in diabetes management and by now it has also translated into actual improved uh, outcomes with respect to blood sugars and uh, the hba1c that is the uh, considered as the gold standard while the 3 month average determining uh, risk of complications etc uh and uh, so basically uh, cgms are of largely of two types one is something called as retrospective where you just impl uh, where you just put the sensor and download it after a period of 7 or 14 days and then you see the data so this is useful for diagnosis making a diagnosis of uh, which can explain why somebody's blood sugars are high or why somebody's blood sugars are low and it is also real time so the another type of cgm is real time where you are actually seeing the blood sugar values and according to that you are deciding the dosages or uh, you are uh, making changes to your meals oh. or uh, other uh, aspects of diabetes management and uh, both these have separate roles in terms of uh, diabetes management uh, so uh, cgm has been uh, and now cgm can also talk to insulin pumps which also is uh, i'm sure would be discussed in the subsequent part of the program uh, so these things make cgm really an exciting uh advance so, so, so what you are uh, telling our viewers dr ganesh is that there are two types of continuous monitoring uh, one is where you as a patient can actually see your values all the time just by having a reader or sometimes even a mobile and we'll talk about that or the other kind where it just records and you turn it into your doctor and then they they download a tracing of your sugar it's almost like an ecg of your blood glucose in a way but i think the analogy that you gave of of blood glucose meter readings being like still photography and continuous glucose monitoring being like video photography 
was very apt and a very good way to communicate this information. So now with the help of CGM, we can actually see what is happening during the school hours or office hours. Yes. We can see what is happening in the night because nighttime low sugars are very common, especially with type 1 diabetes. Uh, in terms of uh, pregnant women, we have ex we yes. can achieve excellent control by using the CGMS uh, devices. These are some of the advantages uh, that so, have so that big have advantages been. because you know you have a continuous sort of tracking. So someone gets a low sugar at night and doesn't know it, and that can be picked up on this. You know, so many such things. Or you get a sudden spike after meals which you are missing on your testing. That too, and, and children and 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 pregnant women. Elderly sometimes, elderly where we are very scared of low blood sugars, even there the role of continuous glucose monitoring uh, is very significant. And from a patient's and parent's perspective, reduced number of pricks. I mean, yes. because if you put one prick and which is giving you the data for 14 days, yes. you are actually reducing a large number of pricks. Yes. Uh, where you are just Otherwise needing pricks sometimes picking. to just cross check lows or highs sometimes. So, uh, uh, Dr. Tandon, let's move to delivery uh, of insulin. Uh, we uh, we have heard about the technology that has changed so much and closely linked to that in a way is the concept of insulin pumps uh, meaning that there are so many situations in diabetes type 1 diabetes for sure all the time but also type 2 diabetes where people require multiple insulin shots and it becomes very difficult to manage that's one part plus to manage the dosages in a more nuanced and accurate manner so can you tell us something about insulin pumps and their position today? So once again, we need to sort of go back to what happens in a normal, healthy human being, right? In a normal, healthy human being, the body produces insulin all the time. Whether you're eating, whether you're not eating, there's going to be a continuous amount of insulin. And then whenever you eat, there's a spike of insulin. Now, the, the point is that when you give multiple injections, you will always get a spike of insulin because that's what's being released in contrast, when you're looking at pumps, which is what we call a continuous infusion, there is always some amount of insulin going in, and the rate at which it is being delivered can be moderated, so that there are times when you're not eating, it can come down low. The moment you're taking a meal or a snack, you can deliver a larger amount to try and take care of the amount of glucose which is entering into the blood. So it's really more physiological than taking multiple shots of insulin. Now, when the whole thing started, it was uh, large, unwieldy, and perhaps uh, very basic. Um, the extent and the fidelity and the fineness with which you could do things was much, much less. Over a period of time, what has really happened is, and we just heard about the continuous glucose monitoring systems, that a conversation between a sensor, which is put in, which is measuring glucose, and the pump. So there is... There are two devices which talk to each other. If, for example, as, a, as the insulin is being released, the sugar drops, one version of the pumps used to just stop releasing insulin. So that was a suspension or a suspension option. Pumps have now become even more advanced. So they can, this, when they look at the, the reading from the CGM, as they can see, well, it's dropping down. It's not yet low but they can predict that it's going to go low, and therefore, in anticipation of a low sugar, the pump can go off. Of course, even more advanced is an ongoing conversation between the sensor and the pump that, you know, based on things, the pump can actually modify, to some extent, the delivery of insulin. So we've gone from a time when there was a standard rate to injections of boluses. You needed to actually self-inject the additional amount to times when you can program what is to be done to times when it switches off so that you don't get low, to times when it switches off in anticipation of it going low, and then of course a conversation. And this is all, and some very, very sort of, I think, elegant hardware, but even more importantly, some very elegant software has come to place, and this software could be commercial, but there's a lot of non-proprietary, uh, free-for-use software yeah. which has come in from academic yeah. institutions which can piggyback onto it. So clearly, we're trying to mimic nature in terms of release, and that's what the pumps have done over a period of time. Obviously, we don't need it in everybody, but as you mentioned, 
if possible, a lot of people with type 1 diabetes will significantly improve yeah. their quality of care. In by, ideal by world, taking... most of our type 1 diabetes patients should be on a pump. Absolutely. Yes. In the ideal world, yes. that's what, you yes. know, and, and, and yeah. wherever there is a third party support for that, yes. I think we should definitely should encourage yes. uh, that because it, it makes this, you know, in, in the smoothness of control yes. Yes. so much better for us. I think this is uh, very important that pumps also, they started out by just being delivery devices. And they were big, you know. The first pump was actually strapped on to the back of the volunteer who, who, who used it. And, and they become tiny. And they're so sensitive now uh, that you can adjust very minor doses of insulin delivery. But not just that. They actually now have pumps very recently, which can respond to the ambient glucose as measured by a continuous monitor that... Dr. Ganesh was mentioning. So, exciting days ahead for diabetes. We'll take a short break and be back with more very soon. No force can stop the change whose time has come. An emerging global power in a fast-changing geopolitical environment. With a goal to modernize, to showcase our defenders who are always battle ready. Watch our special presentations featuring India's defense forces and their capabilities in The Defenders only on Sunset TV. Welcome back after the break. If we go to Dr. Bhansali now, and I'd like you to comment on the role of technology in management of type 2 diabetes. We briefly mentioned the, its importance in type 1 diabetes, but what do you think is the difference technology has made to the usual or the much more common variety of diabetes? Dr. Bhansali, please. In a type 2 diabetes, it has also got a very important role. Even in the patients of type 2 diabetes who are on insulin, who are having a marked glycemic variability or who are having hypoglycemic unawareness. In addition, even in the prevention of diabetes, I will say even in the pre-diabetes, if we give a CGMS facility to them, we can identify the, the biofeedback, we can identify the trains and patterns of blood glucose, so which can help them to have a behavioral modification to manage their even a pre-diabetic state. So there's a definitely role of these new technologies, not only from starting from a glucometer to CGMS, which enables them to find out the uh, changes in a blood glucose profile or so rather say minute to minute changes in a blood glucose profile, which helps them to do a lot of behavioral modification in that way. In addition, the many things have also come up in a new techno in technologies, even in type 2 diabetes. That is, we are going to have a smart insulin pen, which can calculate the doses of insulin, which can calculate even your ICR, insulin carb ratio, and can, can, can calculate the exact doses what you have to put into that. Then, even the type 2 diabetes, you have a lot of advances, and you have so many apps now, which are available on the net, and which can give you some idea that how much calories you have to consume, how much you have to walk every day, they will remind you that your activity is uh, for the day was like this. So if you do this, it can help in preventing the rise in blood glucose. So that has also helped the many patients with the type 2 diabetes to overcome these things. In addition, we are going to have in future these all sensor augmented insulin pumps, even for patients with type 2 diabetes. And they may be useful for those, those who are particularly having either unawareness or having either the glycemic variability. So uh, for those of you who missed our earlier programs, type 1 diabetes is a diabetes where insulin secretion in the body is seriously impaired. So there is deficiency of insulin. More typically, type 1 diabetes occurs in children, although we are realizing more and more that it happens in adults too. And such people require insulin for survival. I mean, they require insulin all the time. That is type 1 diabetes. 
Type 2 diabetes is the usual variety of diabetes. About 95% of diabetes that you see is type 2 diabetes. And that typically happens in adults, in overweight, and those with family history, etc. Just to put it in perspective. And the technologies that are being described are actually useful for both types of diabetes. Maybe a little bit different ways, but nevertheless, especially in advanced type 2 diabetes, where patient somewhat becomes insulin dependent or requires complex regimens, their technologies like insulin pumps can be actually very, very useful. So monitoring, of course, is being used extensively in all types of diabetes. Uh, Dr. Ganesh, do you think it has made a real difference to, the, to your children? I mean, you're a pediatric endocrinologist. And you know, it's also sometimes you're worried that children are very tiny. You don't want to put them on these kind of, you know, gadgets. And so how do you manage that and what difference has it made? Yeah, so there are two aspects to be looked at. One is uh, like in terms of medical uh, um, uh, or scientific aspects, that is how has it contributed to improvement in blood sugars or HbA1c uh, or a reduction of uh, complications or improvement in the time that the person with diabetes spends in a normal range. So now there is enough data, particularly with respect to type 1 diabetes. This data largely comes from uh, developed countries because the technology is being used widely over there. So there are international databases like type 1 diabetes exchange registry or DPV database. So there's data from Australia and uh, New Zealand, uh, these countries, where uh, now in the recent past de couple of decades, there is a significantly improved percentage of patients who are able to achieve good HbA1c's without any increased risk of hypoglycemia, without any increased risk of low sugars. Previously, whenever somebody wanted very good A1c, they used to have this bargain Frequent with low sugar, increased uh, frequency of low sugars. And now with the technology, uh, it has made possible to see numbers like HbA1c of 7, uh, 6.5 without increased uh, risk of low sugars. With respect to the patient aspects, it, has, uh, it really uh, is uh, uh, a significant advantage not to carry a bag full of your insulin pens and eyes and uh, all sorts of uh, diabetes supplies just everywhere. And you just wear your diabetes management on your sleeves, basically. You, are, you have a sensor here and you have a pump and you do everything. Uh, so in terms of flexibility of life, quality of life, in, uh, ability to have flexibility in terms of eating, uh, it has really contributed to these aspects of type 1 diabetes management. So those who are managing it successfully are extremely happy about these technologies. So, so Professor mm -hmm. Tadner, there's also this thing about prevention of complications, a different use of technology. We're not talking of pumps and continuous monitoring now, but we're talking of ways, uh, you know, that one can sort of, with the use of technology, help diabetics check the retina or prevent complications, for example. You want to highlight on that? I think you raise a very important point because actually the overarching goal for managing people with diabetes is not merely just to get the numbers in range, but also to ensure that that translates into prevention of complications. And I think that is the big picture out here. And uh, the key complications, of course, would be those which involve the eye, which is the retina of the eye, the kidney, the nerves, the heart, the brain. Now, all of them require a certain skill set to diagnose. All of them require certain investigations to be done. And let me take the example of, of mm. the retina. Mm. You know, so uh, you need to send a patient often to an ophthalmologist who is uh, competent in that skill to look at the back of the eye. Very often you keep telling your patients, please go and see the ophthalmologist. It's a part of an annual, mandatory annual review. Now, most patients will reflect and say, but why should I go and see the ophthalmologist? I don't have any problem. And so from what should be done regularly, I think in India, maybe 20% of patients actually end up going for their annual review. Now, would it not be simpler if, like when we are seeing the patient, when we're measuring a, a finger prick glucose as a point of care, can we not do a point of care retina examination? Now, for that also there are, there are cameras which look at the back of the eye. Those cameras are more elaborate ones, of course, are primarily located within the ophthalmic clinics. But you can have handheld cameras which can be held at the physician's place. There are phone-based cameras which can again be used by the physician. We've actually done some work in which you can do a selfie photograph of your camera, of your fundus also. 
So it is all really good use of technology. Also think of it that I am, we are living in Delhi at the moment. He is an ophthalmologist around the corner. Now, you may want to see a retina specialist and you're living in a relatively small place without access to medical care. Photograph can be taken and, and tele-ophthalmology yes. can be done. You can actually just transmit the photograph and that can be seen in real time or offline by an ophthalmologist and advice given whether something needs to be done or not done. The next step, of course, is using even more sort of higher quality software. You can have artificial intelligence which can read the photograph and give you an immediate turnaround and says, well, listen, this is a problem. See mm -hmm. an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. And then when you're a physician who's seeing a patient, you have a greater conviction mm -hmm. in telling your mm -hmm. patient to go and uh, see the ophthalmologist because you have already got real-time feedback. So, so that's all quite of this amazing, spectrum can Dr. be Dr. done it's using quite amazing technology. amazing how much technology is helping us. You know, to give you a simple example, uh, nowadays when people somebody with diabetes walks into a well-equipped diabetes clinic, uh, within a few minutes, you can get all your numbers. You can get your HbA1c, your blood glucose, of course. You can get your uh, renal function test, kidney function test, your cholesterol profile, and uh, a fundus photograph, as Dr. Tandon mentioned, uh, a foot test. And all can be done within in less than an hour. And you come there with no data at all. So, so a lot of advances in technology, and I leave the last word to Dr. Bansali. Dr. Bansali, what are the challenges that you see that we are facing in this, and how do you suggest that we overcome them, especially in the context of India? The uh, challenge is the person should be technology, that they should be uh, aware about the technology and they should be interested in technology to implement it. I think that's a very important, because even in reading or interpreting the data of a CGMS will require, even for modulating the pump and operating the pump, you require really, you should be technosic. The second issue is the healthcare provider should have an interest because we have only, uh, uh, there, there are limitations in the resource, human resources. And lastly, we should have a trust in technology. We want so many variability in a glucose values by a glucometer. You always want a variability in a CGMS versus glucometer. So I think that, yes, many things have been overcome by having a calibration at the factory level, calibration at the uh, company level, and then calibrating even at home. But still, you find a large variability in glucose. So I think that human resources, that also makes very important. One should be techno savvy. The cost is also in our scenario. Uh, I have been reminded that some of the states in our country, like uh, Kerala, they are, they are providing the free pump insulin pump facility to all type 1 diabetes patients. So I think government has also taken some initiatives, but it has to be taken in many other steps. And then it is not only providing a pump to them, but it is also maintaining because the recurring cost is also too much. So I think these are the important challenges in that, but I think we will overcome as the time will pass and we'll have a, many things new in technology that will definitely make the quality of life of our patients much better. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bansali, for those comments. Uh, very true that uh, there has to be interest on all sides. And I think there is increasing interest in this area. But optimal use of technology is also very important. We cannot be driven by technology. We should use technology in patient care to help our patients. The goal is the patient, right? The goal is not the technology, right? And the technology is only as good as it helps our patient, is easy for them, is convenient for them, and helps improve outcomes in terms of reducing complications of any condition. In this case, of course, we are talking about uh, diabetes. Cost remains a major barrier uh, in, in widespread use of technology. We expect that with greater use, the cost will come down. We also expect, and that is happening in the software stage already, uh, uh, where you have advances which are indigenous, which are Indian, and that can really help our patients. That's a true area for Make in India to get into, to use technology to help diabetes. If you want to reduce costs, more and more manufacturing, more and more ideas have to come from India. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.